Welcome to the happiest hour live, everyone, where no matter where you are right now, if things are wonderful or if things are challenging, uh, every week we strive to help you make life just a little bit better. Uh, my name is Dan Lerner. And I am Alan Schlechter. Uh, and he is Dr. Alan Schlechter. You're so humble with that. And together over the past eight years, we have taught the science of happiness to over 6,000 students at New York University. Now, just a few months ago, as many of you know by now, uh, while teaching our first Zoom class for NYU, Alan and I realized that there was this great opportunity uh, to teach not only these students, but also to share this wonderful information uh, and these wonderful experts whom we were constantly citing and discussing and having them read with a much broader audience. And that is you. So with the generous uh, support of the Crane Center for Mindful Living, each week we invite a renowned expert and author to discuss how you might live a more fulfilling life. And this show is about you, uh, you as an individual, you as a community, uh, you seeking to live a more fulfilling life. So while we will kick it all off and we'll begin our wonderful chat today with our amazing guests, um, the chat box is open. So uh, feel free to chat with one another or chat with us or drop questions in there uh, that makes the hour what, what you would like it to be. Now, when it comes to living a fulfilling life, many of the topics that our guests have discussed have been uh, in line with what we might expect. We've had folks talk about hope. We've had folks talk about transcendence and about meaning, to name a few. Uh, but one that seems to have leapt to the forefront of many people's minds that we get asked on a weekly basis here on the show in a way, uh, but we haven't addressed yet, is, is accomplishment, right? So many of us, when, this, uh, when we had to get into the lockdown and all of a sudden life changed, thought, okay, how am I gonna make the most of this? Uh, I'm finally gonna get to that stack of books next to my bed. I'm finally gonna read or maybe write uh, the great American novel. I'm gonna finally learn that new language or learn to play an instrument. I'm gonna start writing letters to people. And for many of us, absolutely none of this happened. Right? For many of us, uh, folks find themselves frustrated and they're asking, how has it got to be five o'clock or six o'clock p.m., that is, already? And we're doing that while eating a bowl of cereal and playing a video game and mindlessly surfing and looking at an ever pile, a growing pile of laundry at the same time. So how does that work? What's going on with time? Why is it flying by? Why do we set out to do things and not necessarily get them done? And what accomplishments are enough? What does it mean to be productive? Uh, and if it's not about productivity, am I not spending enough time with my kids? Am I spending too much time with my kids? Do I feel guilty for not spending more time uh, with Zoom, on Zoom with friends? How can I find a little structure in the world where so much of it has vanished and time seems to fly by? So today we have just the right person to chat with about willpower, about time, about happiness, about its impact on our well-being, and also what's actually happening inside this three-pound piece of meatloaf in our skulls. Today we get the opportunity to welcome Dr. Heather Berlin. Uh, Heather is a cognitive neuroscientist and assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, where she explores the neural basis of impulsive and compulsive psychiatric and neurological disorders uh, with the aim of developing novel treatments. She's also interested in the brain basis of consciousness and of creativity. Uh, she has won far too many awards and she has far too many accomplishments for me to mention. Uh, but one of the things that we adore about her is how she can take all this remarkably impressive smarty pants knowledge and make it simple and really helpful, uh, not only for her patients, but for the general listener. So she, you'll find her in various places where she does exactly that. Uh, she hosts Star Talk, All Stars, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. She hosted the PBS series um, Science Goes to the Movies, Discovery Channel series Superhuman Showdown. She has made numerous media appearances um, from BBC to History Channel, but I think in my estimation, most impressively, uh, was featured in the documentary, uh, Bill Nye, Science Guy. Because if you can do that, you're amazing. Now, all that said, uh, perhaps her least notable accomplishment was meeting me a few years ago at a conference. And she also has the terrible judgment to respond when I followed up to say hello. Uh, I think uh, that I definitely got the best of that deal uh, because she's a really wonderful human being as well as having all these accomplishments but now you get to have uh, uh, the best of that deal because we get to welcome her to the show. So without any further ado, allow me to welcome uh, Dr. Heather Berlin. Oh, what an intro. Right. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me here. Oh my gosh, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for making the time. Um, 
you can't do those intros without uh, without all that wonderful stuff behind it. But, but you know, Heather and I, and Alan and Heather and I, I'm sorry, we're all talking before the show, and we thought, you know, we always ask a question, Heather, to kick the show off, to sort of have people prep or think about how they can make the most of this. So before we before we go on, the question that we all came up with was this, and this is for all of you out there, and if you feel comfortable, we would love for you to enter your a response to this into the chat box, but if at the end of this hour, if you had more willpower, more self-regulation, right, what would you do differently? What would you do with it? How would you apply that willpower? So if y'all want to go ahead and take a second, spend more time studying. All right, wonderful. Move to a different city. Create something. Cooking, eating healthy foods, waking up earlier. Probably taking the French course. Yeah, me too. Uh, publishing on my website. You guys are my thesis. What are you seeing here, Heather? I love the eat less cookies one. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like we all have this internal fight between our kind of in some way, it's like two parts of ourselves, right? You know, you have um, these subcortical parts of the brain, like our evolutionarily older parts of the brain, or some people call a reptilian brain that is sensitive to immediate pleasure or avoidance of pain, right? So Freud would call it like our id impulses. You know, I want that cookie right now. And then you have the more recently evolved parts of our brain, like the prefrontal cortex, which thinks about the future consequences of our actions, you know, ways like what's the benefit um, to that decision or, or the cost. And humans actually have the largest percentage of prefrontal cortex compared to the rest of the brain than any other animal. So we theoretically have the most ability to um, kind of control those basic animalistic impulses for some future long-term goal, right? So it gives us that advantage. It also, can lead to things like anxiety, right? Because say a dog isn't thinking that much into the future. You know, it has fear, but it's not thinking about, you know, it's, it's you know, having an existential crisis or thinking about its own demise or some future, um, something negative that can happen to them in the future that they ruminate about. But we have that ca ca capability. So it's a, it's a, you know, there's some positive aspects to it and there's some negative. But basically when these two systems are, working and functioning properly and communicating, we make adaptive decisions, mm. right? And so you might say, okay, I want that chocolate cookie now, but you know what, I'm, I, I'm gonna go on this diet, so I'm not going to, and the pleasure of having it now doesn't outweigh the reward of, you know, I don't know, looking good in that new dress, so I'm not gonna do it. But if a lot of the patients I see, if they have damage to the prefrontal cortex or underactivation or overactivation of that limbic subcortical drive, like the accelerator can override the brake system and then they can be impulsive and make maladaptive decisions. So a lot of what these people are, you know, what people are saying, it has to do with having some, you know, basic drive and we want to sort of do things. We tend to go down to the sort of least common denominator, you know, the easiest thing is to lay on the couch, right? So anything we do above and beyond that takes a little bit of cognitive energy or motivation um, to overcome that sort of basal impulse to just, you know, let's say relax as the default. Well, I also think about, as you're saying that, I love how you just described that. Um, the, the COVID-19 stress, it's a very unique stress. It's very unusual. I haven't had it. I mean, I, I know I'm mature looking, but I didn't live through the uh, flu outbreak in the 1920s. Um, and so I've never experienced this before. And I think uh, that alone has thrown off my brain in a very uh, unique way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the brain is, what's good about it is it's so adaptive, but it's also very sensitive to what's happening in the environment, right? And so it can react quickly to sudden changes, um, both good, that's good and bad. And suddenly, I mean, first, obviously, when this all happened in the initial few weeks, the stress response, you know, the fight or flight, um, our physiologic um, response, some people, and there was actually even in New York where we're based, there was an exodus, right? People who had other homes, they left, they fled, you know, that was the first impulse. Then it was like, 
safety behaviors, you know, like buying toilet paper for whatever reason, you know, things that can kind of calm down this, um, this initial physiological reaction. Um, then over time, it started developing into these more prolonged stress and our world started to shrink, right? You mm -hmm. can't go out. And the normal things that we used to do to relieve stress, maybe hang out with friends, you know, play basketball or, you know, whatever it was are now suddenly removed. You're in these close quarters, maybe relationships that you were in where you maybe avoid each other because you'd go to work or whatnot. Now you're kind of intensified in these relationships. So all it's sort of the perfect storm for, um, you know, increased stress and people who already had a vulnerability going into this, maybe who didn't have any mental health issues, but were vulnerable, this stressor could have triggered them to actually um, develop a full blown um, illness, like whether depression or an anxiety disorder. And people who already had, or were dealing with mental health issues, it would exacerbate it. Um, so, you know, the brain can only deal with so much. And sometimes, you know, when the stress becomes overwhelming, um, it can't cope. And then you have these, you know, psychiatric illnesses that can emerge. It's so interesting you bring that up. I, some of my anxious patients at the beginning were like, at last, everyone's like me. You all know what it's like now. It's, this is what I'm like all the time. But now that it's worn on, um, they're not feeling uh, the benefits of not feeling as alone anymore. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I also noticed this and I wrote a little bit about this as well as talking to some colleagues. There was this subgroup of patients that were doing slightly better and it was surprising, especially people with anxiety. So people with social anxiety, you know, all of a sudden now there's no pressure, right? They don't have to go out to parties. They don't have to, you know, so it's great. They can just stay home. And even people with contamination type OCD, who mm -hmm. you would think would be doing much worse, were actually yep. doing better. Um, yep. You know, suddenly they're not alone, they're validated. Other people are now engaging in these behaviors that they wish they always would have engaged in, right? Washing hands, nobody's shaking hands anymore. So there was this um, weird, like counterintuitive reaction in a subgroup of patients. Um, but I agree that now some people, the isolation is superseding that, right? The lack of, especially people living alone, the lack of human contact. I mean, we need even the touch, you know, if touch releases oxytocin, it's a feel good chemical. Um, and being deprived of that for a long period of time, again, can really exacerbate things, loneliness, um, you know, feelings, those feelings of isolation. So, you know, so, so, I mean, given that, so what are some, so what are some ways you've found to, to effectively manage these things? You know, because there are so many folks having such a variety of experiences, and yet there are some, there are certain common factors that you brought up. If we are living under the same roof as, as other people, Fortunately, we have some of those things and we're missing others like our friends and Alan and I were talking yesterday. I was like, dude, I miss you. You know, we, realized we haven't seen each other and you know, we see each other every day like this. We haven't really seen each other. And for those folks who are living by themselves and I have a number of friends who are that way, who are dealing with that, it is um, incredibly challenging. So, so what, are, what are you finding to be effective? So I think that a couple of things. So one is obviously keeping up connections, even if they're virtual connections, because in some ways, okay, it's not as good as in person, but sometimes our brain can't tell that much of the difference, right? It's just a signal coming in. So whether the person is there and it's three dimensional or two dimensional, you know, um, having that connection can be just as satisfying um, for us emotionally. Um, also, I think creating small goals. So, you know, our worlds have shrank, right? So where I used to maybe get pleasure because I was going to be going to fly to Europe and give a talk somewhere, you know, that was exciting. Okay, I can't do that now. But maybe my goal this week is to clean out my closet, you know, and then I do that and I feel good about it. You know, I accomplish something. Um, so it's like, it's, it's creating goals, novelty, you know, our brain likes novelty. So we've if we've all been in our house for weeks upon weeks, we habituate to the environment around us, right? And what we know from sensory deprivation studies is that when the brain is deprived of stimuli, it'll start to hallucinate, right? It wants, it craves um, activation. So we can stimulate it by, let's say you're someone who always does crossword puzzles, like pick up a new you know, um, game to play, try to stimulate your brain with novelty. And we can find that in many different ways. And it works differently for everybody. You know, not the same activity is going to be as exciting for one person as the other, but find something that stimulates you, that excites you. Um, 
within the smaller worlds that we're in right now. Um, I think those are some strategies. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that one of the things you're bringing up is that we can find smaller, smaller things that can, that can give us this. Cause, cause I mentioned before, you know, so many of people are like, I'm learning a new language. I'm learning a new instrument. And, and in the comments, even as I look at the comments on the side right now, it's uh, go back to, for example, to the hobbies and pastimes I had when I was younger. Mm -hmm. This seems like a manageable thing and an approachable thing. Someone else said, uh, Jamie, actually, that is my college roommate, who I adore. Uh, you know, identify and practice daily routines that, uh, that fulfill me. So that seems like a doable thing, and yet it's so challenging, right? Yeah. I often, I say to people, if, you know, obviously motivation, you know, can be hard right now. Mm -hmm. And there's this pressure you know, especially I, in the beginning, everyone's like, oh, you should work on your book now. You should be writing that novel. Yeah, while I'm homeschooling my kids. And, you know, <laughs> I'm actually more, you know, busy now than I was before. So, you know, I think that not to put pressure on yourself, that you need to be productive. Um, this is not a normal time, right? And, but w when I talk to patients as well, it's like, there are a number of different activities you can, you can do throughout the day. Let's say the lowest sort of um, uh, com activity for you is playing video games. Okay, if, if not, you can't do anything else, you're playing video games, but like try to go one step higher. You know, maybe it's reading a book, if you can handle that. You know, maybe the next step is like, you're gonna be working on your blog, but you know, and you can play around within this sort of hierarchy that maybe you can develop for yourself. So you don't always have to be at the top of the hierarchy, like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be writing my book. But, you know, try to always go maybe one step up from where you are at that moment. Um, and you'll still feel a sense of accomplishment. Okay, so I didn't write my book, but I, at least I didn't play video games all day. You know, I, I maybe sent a few emails and that's enough. So again, those are like those smaller goals. They don't have to be like learning a new language. If you can, great. But if not, you know, just try to be one step up in your hierarchy. We, there was a wonderful question that I've, I've never thought about related to this idea of accomplishment, which was somebody said, is this craving for accomplishment limited to the human species? I mean, we, we know animals love, um, or they appear to have affection for each other, um, but is accomplishment all up here? It's not all up here. I mean... Yeah, well, there's drive, you know, there's motivation, there are different ways to, you know, they can be expressed in other animals in different ways. Hmm. But part of, I think, mental health is being okay with just being, right? With, you know, not having to define ourselves by what we accomplish, mm -hmm. right? and being okay in the moment. And I think that's a lot where mindfulness comes in, where you can just say like, I'm here right now, the sun is shining, I'm healthy, you know, I'm okay. And instead of this, like, I should be, there should, there's no shoulds, there shouldn't be any shoulds, right? So there's nothing you need to be doing. You can just be, and, and I think the greatest, when, when people are looking for mental health and stability, it's not about being happy, I think, well, although this is called the happiest hour, like it's good to be happy sometimes, it's great, but it's fleeting. And I think that the goal should be equanimity, is just being okay, not being sad, you know, and that is enough. You know, well, yeah. We're, we are with you. And just to be clear to everyone, this morning, uh, I was up too late last night. Um, and this morning, I was really grumpy. Um, but, but you're right. <laughs> There, there was, I, when I was biking to Bellevue, um, after somehow getting through my daughter's math problems um, with her, um, which was the hardest thing I did today, just to be clear, getting through my 10-year-old child's math problems um, was uh, by far the most challenging thing. And I saw some very high-risk patients today e easier than doing the math problems. Although I will say, just a quick, quick little story, uh, she was sitting next to me and I was trying to get her to do some of the math and then I would help her instead of me doing it with her where I end up doing it. Um, because I don't have great accomplishment feelings when I do my daughter's math problems for her. And, um, but all of a sudden she started to laugh next to me. And I looked over and uh, the question was, Hassan needs help with his fraction problem. And she had written underneath, Hassan should do his work himself. And she was like, I'm funny. 
And it was so <laughs> dear um, that she had thought of a joke. Um, that was her accomplishment. We then like rejoiced in that moment. And after that, I left. And as I was biking to work and there was a pretty sun out, um, I had a moment where I thought, I'm not going to get anything of what I need to get done today because I'm tired and I'm off. But I'm going to do whatever I can do. And I had that moment. The, my question is, how do I increase those moments? <laughs> right. Um, well, what do you do? I, yeah, I think part of it, and actually, it, it, I can relate this to children as well. So um, a lot of what, and this brings us back to impulse control, a lot of what we're trying to do um, when we're trying to achieve a goal is to suppress those basic desires. Oh, like I'm tired now. I really just want to sleep or, you know, I'm hungry. I just want to eat or I just want to watch TV right. and, and suppress that with our prefrontal cortex turning on and like a brake system that's down regulating that so that we can achieve some higher goal, you know, so that we can go to work and be productive. Um, and it's always that those systems that when you're tired um, or, you know, you haven't eaten enough or anything can make it harder to suppress those desires and achieve some long-term goal. So one, one easy things are, you know, get enough sleep, you know, eat well, you know, stay, exercise, all of those things. Um, but we're constantly engaging this prefrontal cortex to suppress those desires to, to be productive. But one thing I think that can help, and again, this is counterintuitive, is sometimes to just let go to say, you know what, I'm gonna give my mind a rest. I'm gonna just let it wander. I'm gonna daydream. I'm gonna get into these, you know, what people call flow states, right? Where you are releasing that suppression of the prefrontal cortex. You're letting it sort of decreasing activation and letting anything come to the surface. And kids, you know, their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until about their mid twenties, right? So they tend to be more creative, just like your daughter, you know, thinking outside the box, coming up with these novel jokes. And, and in a way, depending on what you define as productivity, but I think that the most intelligent people are the most creative people, the ones that come up with new ideas. Look, anybody can do sort of the grunt work and, you know, even take Darwin, for example, like he was, you know, categorizing all these things, right? And anybody could have categorized all the different species and, and, but then he had this novel idea of how they're all connected. And that's probably the most productive thing than all the hours of cataloging, right? So if you allow your mind those moments of letting go, um, I think you'll be more productive in the long run than trying to force yourself to be productive. It's like if you're writing a novel, like I need to be creative now, I need to write. You know, that's the worst thing you can do. The best thing you can do is go for a walk, walk away from it and let your mind be free and then come back to it um, with new ideas. Well, it's funny, Alan and I, we, we did our, our course on exercise, our class on exercise. We, we put a bunch of people up on the, on the screen. It's Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, Barack Obama and um, uh, who it's Beethoven. Beethoven. Beethoven, that's right. Um, and a number of other folks, and what do they have in common? They walked constantly. That's where they say they got Dickens. They, they came up with their best ideas. And yet here we are stuck inside in a way. But we're able to still, to your point, how do we sort of let go and start moving and not, not focus too intently on it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are actually reporting having more vivid dreams now. Again, because like, you know, we're under-stimulated, but our mind still wants to create. It wants to, so, so people are having these more vivid dreams. Like our imagination, you know, can go anywhere. Even if we're locked down in, in many ways, that doesn't prevent us from our minds being free. Um, and that's the great escape, right? For anybody. I mean, people who are in prison, you know, people, it's all, it's in a way it's, I mean, obviously it's not as bad as being in prison, but it's similar in that we are restricted physically, but we have our minds and that's the greatest gift. And so letting it go, there are times to be what I, you know, I call it convergent thinking, you know, thinking very rationally and rigidly and having all this control but there should be just as much time where you allow your brain to let go and have this divergent thinking and you can make novel associations between ideas. So there's a time to kind of intake the information and then a time to let kind of our unconscious process it. Um, Cause the unconscious can process much more information than our conscious brain can. Hmm. So I, you know, I don't want to like shoot for too much structure here because you know, one of the, one of the questions I find consistently both from students and clients and lots of other folks is um, that they kind of recognize this. That, they're, that they, there's this opportunity now uh, with lack of structure to be able to build that in somehow, and yet they also need some structure. And some, a few people have mentioned 
structure and how do I create that? So, and the question for them is, how much is too much? How much is not enough? And clearly we have what, 101 people on this Zoom right now. If we pulled everybody, everyone would have a slightly to, to vastly different idea of what works for them. So how can people think about that in a way that's, that they can get a sense of, okay, I'm, I'm not letting my mind go too much or not enough. How do they find that place? Right. Everybody has different thresholds and it's almost like, you know, raising children. There's no one right way to do it. You know, there's certain things where, you know, like, okay, that's just, you know, wrong, right? Neglect or things that are at the extremes. Um, so everybody is calibrated slightly differently. I do think that having some sort of structure to at least um, demarcate the time that is passing, because there's this, you know, where, where it could become one long day. And, mm -hmm. and I think that can lead to, um, some people can feel despondent or get a little depressed. And so depending on what your inclinations are, if, if you're one of those types of people, having a little bit of structure throughout the day, like, you know, make sure you get dressed in the morning, you know, try to uh, like maintain certain routines um, so that you don't lose sight, you know, of, of the days and time passing, um, which can, can have negative effects on our brain. Um, so, so, you know, I always think of like the days, like chunks of time and you can divide them up however you want. And maybe there's a chunk of like, you're just sitting around doing nothing. And that's a chunk of time. And now you're going to move into another chunk where it's going to be an active, like physical activity. And then there's some sort of mental challenge part of the day. You know, it doesn't have to be structured like a specific schedule all day. Although my homeschooling children have that, but, um, and then you find the days will actually pass quicker. And the more you are doing in your day, the more you kind of quantify the day into these units of time and activities, the quicker it will go. If it's unstructured, it will feel more like it's dragging on because time perception is subjective. Um, and so we can play around with our subjectivity and make it feel faster or slower depending on our activities. Well, how, do you, how do you do that? What do you do? I, I mean, it's... Oh, I can tell you my, my day, my structure, if you'd like. <laughs> tell me about your day. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I'm a kind of person, I'm juggling a lot of things. So no day is the same. I dedicate, this is, I'll show you. I don't even hold, have a, um, online calendar. I'm still old school and I have like a schedule book that I write in and look at how chaotic it is. So that's my structure. However, it makes sense to me. Is that a whole and, day? Was that, was that like 8.30 to 9 o'clock <laughs> morning? Because wow. <laughs> I mean, I make these little notes and, but you know, I get up at the same time, you know, I have a routine with my kids. I get them set up on their homeschooling. I'm simultaneously, then I go to my computer so I can homeschool and then work and be in between back and forth, you know, throughout the day. And there are chunks of time for different activities. Um, and then sometimes I'll have a call like this and then my husband will have to watch the kids, you know, so we're coordinating amongst us. And then we always make it at six o'clock or sometimes earlier if I can get off earlier we're outdoors, we go outside in the garden. Um, we're fortunate to be in suburbia, so we have a backyard and, and there's no more screens for the rest of the day. That's what we're, we're doing. Cause our kids are on screens much more than they used to be throughout the day. So we say, okay, screen time's over, we're going outside and it's family time. And we're fortunate to be able to do that. Before the pandemic, most of us, I was never home at six, you know? My husband was traveling, he's a performer. And now we have this family time, which, Again, it's good, but it also, if relationships are not good, it can be a bad thing, right? You know, it can, you can start to irritate each other, whereas before you both were never hardly seeing each other. So, um, but yeah, so then we have dinner and then it becomes bedtime. And, and I, I like the routine. I find that the weekends are harder because mm -hmm. of the lack of structure, but that's me. You know, I like having um, a day where I know what, you know, is going to be happening throughout the day. The weekends, it's this ambiguous and it's harder. And other parents are saying that as well. Um, I'm, I'm totally with you. I call it Camp Schlechter. I need it to be, I, I would like to wake up and, and, and this has always been a difference between Dan and I, you know, about like when we've talked about our ideal vacation, when I go on vacation, I'm the same way. I'm like, from nine to nine thirty, we'll be having breakfast, and from nine thirty to eleven. And I, I think some people would the idea of having that structure um, not is a not a vacation, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I mean it also because it's so different. We can sorry because we have none whatsoever because we know this isn't a vacation. Yeah. Right? So I found you know when my little boy finished homeschooling for sixth grade a couple weeks ago, immediately first thing in the morning we wake up and after you know twelve year olds will do, he's like I don't want to get up. We're going to the park. You bring your bike. I'm bringing the dogs. We do it for like two hours. Awesome. And now he sneaks in our room. He's like, yeah, it's time to go. And I was like, oh god. Right, but and now it forces me to put on pants, which is nice and novel. Uh, but you know, at least we know we have that time in the morning, those hours together, and then he'll do his thing the rest of the day. But I know we have that, and it's a wonderful way, at least for me, to start the day. Uh, and that little bit of structure, and then we have our chart in our, you know, this is who gets the living room because he has a dance class, or I have a happiest hour, or something like that. And that has been really helpful without overly scheduling the way. Right? Yeah. Some people need more. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it's neuroticism also. I mean, I'm not saying it's necessarily a healthy thing, right? But I feel the need, if I'm not doing things, I feel like I'm not being productive. And I'm not saying productive in the sense of, you know, having to produce things, but having to have accomplished something in the day. And that makes me feel good. And that doesn't necessarily a good thing. It doesn't have to be that way. But whether it's doing actual work or, okay, we took a bike ride and then we planted in the garden and then we're, you know, baking a cake, whatever it is, I feel like, oh, I accomplished something that day. And, and that makes me feel good personally, but that's because I've always just been, you know, I might be too driven and that might be problematic, but for me that works, you know, that makes me feel good in the day. Heather, you've, you've talked about, um, you know, all of these activities change the way time moves during the day. As somebody just said, um, I work half the week and I've noticed the days where I don't work, I feel aimless and the day really drags on. And you talk about time and um, I, could you talk a little bit about time, a relationship to time? Is it a sixth sense? Is, where is time in the brain? Do we have a clock? Is there a clock in there? <laughs> Yeah, I did some research on time perception in the brain and sort of, you know, how we perceive time because it's an illusion. I mean, we are creating, just like everything else, our perception is, is constructed by our brain and doesn't necessarily correlate with reality. And it's the same thing with our perception of time. And so what I found is there's certain parts of the prefrontal cortex that are related to time perception. And so when people have damage to that part of the brain, or I found people who are um, impulsive, they have a different sense of time. Yep. So it's not just like, okay, you can have one marshmallow an hour, wait and have two marshmallows later. It's that the waiting subjectively feels much longer. Like waiting five minutes to them would feel like 10 minutes on top of waiting to get that reward. So it makes it even harder for them to control their impulses. So that the same parts of the brain that are involved in impulse control are also involved in time perception. Um, but you know, it's also, just going back for one second to that, like doing things in the day, this sense of purpose is also related to our sense of identity. So, you know, suddenly we're stripped of that. Like, let's say you are a, you know, I don't know, a famous actor, whatever, you know, you have, you go on set, you get treated great. Now suddenly you're stripped of that, you're at home, you know, this, this great um, equalizer. And a lot of people are like, what's my purpose? you know, who am I? What am I, you know, what is it? And we've gotten, you know, people talk about, we've gone back to our basic values and it's family. But, you know, who am I? And I think that's part of that drive to like, you know, have a purpose. But, um, but with time, so time changes in terms of the activities that we do in the day. The more you do, the faster it seems to go by. Um, and so when you're doing the same thing all day, it, it will, it, there's nothing to sort of like, if I said to you, how much time has passed since we started talking until now? You'd have to like have something that marked, like when did this time period start? Right, and you'd have to remember that that moment, and it, there was a change, right? Maybe it was like, oh, I turned on my computer, and but when you're not having those changes throughout the day, knowing when the time period began and where you are now, there's nothing to kind of mark it, and we mm -hmm. lose track, and it's almost like being in a sensory deprivation kind of environment where there, you know, time, and it might contract or expand, you know, depending on the person. Um, so, so yeah, it's not the same for everybody. And for some people in this pandemic, time will feel like it's dragging on. And for others, it'll feel like, wh where did, you know, where did the time go? How did a month go by already? So, so speaking of how we spend our time, and this is something that we had discussed earlier um, before the show, speaking of how we spend our time and structure our time, what, and what, how we're understanding our perception of time right now, uh, I'm, I'm curious, I almost want to sort of dovetail this with Sharon's question about 
are there new areas of research you've become interested in, given uh, the ubiquity of the pandemic across the globe? So as we anticipate what's to come, right, how we're going to feel about, uh, about leaving our homes and becoming, uh, having our day-to-days, what are some of the things that you're seeing that you think are going to help people be resilient, that are going to help them address the anxiety that is, and I should, should ask that question. I'm just curious right now, folks out there, you know, are, are you, when things open up again, when we're able to really go out and, every, and most majority of things are open, are you going to feel more or less anxious right. when you go out for your day to day? I'm curious if folks can enter that in to the chat. Yeah, and, and we, you know, we, we talked about this before a little of, you know, I think, and this is just a prediction, but I am curious to see what people say. I predict that people will be more anxious as things start to open up. Everybody's saying right. more, 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 more. Oh, everyone's saying more, right. more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because it's the now, you know, right now we're in our little bubbles. We know we're sort of safe. We've been in isolation, but now there's, you're opening yourself up to the possibility, the uncertainty have I been exposed? Has this person been exposed? Who should I let in my house? Who should I not? And so that uncertainty, that's where anxiety um, can fester. And, and I think it is going to increase anxiety. I mean, first of all, you know, people have done surveys right now and some have said that mental health issues have increased like by 700%. Like it's, it's a huge, you know, one in four Americans, greater than one in four are feeling some sort of, you know, either depression, anxiety, or having some sort of mental health issue. So now to think that it might get worse, I mean, that's sort of a pandemic in and of itself. And then think about also PTSD with the frontline workers and, and whatnot. So I think part of it, resilience is key. Now, what is resilience? There's some studies that have looked at this, that there's a genetic component, right? So they'll look at people, um, two soldiers say, who have fought in the same war, um, and one goes on to develop PTSD and the other doesn't. Well, you know, why not? They've both been exposed to the same thing. And there are some genetic differences. The other thing that, so that's not much you can do about that. But some people talk about inoculation, which is a sort of, it's almost like a vaccination against um, um, stress where small stressors throughout life can actually help prepare you for a larger stressor. Right. So people who are completely sheltered, you know, that's why they say like, don't just shelter your kids from disappointments. Like they need a couple of disappointments to learn, to build up that muscle, to know what to do. Um, so I think, you know, obviously again, there's not a lot you can do in the short period of time now to kind of build that up. But what's one strategy is to, to have inoculation, but living in the uncertainty, I think is going to be the biggest issue. Um, and one thing and that we do in, and is exposure therapy, right? Just allowing yourself to live with the uncertainty, to feel the anxiety, to accept it, you know, but to still engage in the behaviors anyway, because the only other alternative is we become agoraphobic. You know, we, we are afraid to leave our homes and that self perpetuates and that can become very detrimental. So the idea is that it's going to be uncomfortable, you know, use the proper precautions, wear a mask. If you want to wear gloves, whatever it may be, use your hand sanitizer, wash your hands, but get out a bit, be safe, but don't, you know, when things start to open up in a safe way, try to expose yourself. I'm not even saying to people, but to a little anxiety, give yourself a little exposure to some of that anxiety little by little. So you can build that muscle up again. So you don't become, you know, afraid to leave your house. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I just got lost in uh, thinking about cognitive behavioral therapy. I was like, this is a cognitive behavioral um, therapist approach. And, and maybe just saying a little bit about the, that, I think, for people. What do you hear? Yeah. Well, I'm curious. What do you, when you say that, what comes to mind for you? To him? For you. I mean, for Alan, you know, you're, you, you, that came to mind for you. What was it about all this that, that brought that to mind? Oh, no, just the, um, I would say the, I'd say that during my lifetime, there has been this uh, shift from focus on the cognitions to focusing on exposure and behavioral activation. That it's, it's, it's if you don't have the exposure, if you don't let yourself feel um, a little uncomfortable. Um, it's, we, you just don't see the change. And no matter what kind of therapy, there has to be, you have to find the exposure. 
sometimes you have to learn ways of calming yourself, um, self-compassion, breathing techniques, PM, progressive muscle relaxation. There are lots of different techniques just so you can tolerate um, the exposure, but you have to have the exposure. And, um, and then, you know, going back to actually what you said before, um, and I've loved everything you've said is, uh, really, is, is the idea of accepting that it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, just as we have to accept that our minds um, are, can, can have time to be all over the place. And that nice moment I had today where I was like, yep, today's going to be today. And, and that doesn't happen all the time. It just, I, I, I wish that could happen more often. Um, and uh, I, was gonna, I think acceptance is key and also not, um, sometimes we're our own worst enemies because we, we have this perception, like we think everybody else is, is happier and is more organized and is, you know, doing great. And why aren't I, and what's wrong with me? And, and to kind of let go of that, like nobody's walking around perfectly happy all day and, you know, perfectly well organized and perfectly productive and all of that, you know, we are human, we are flawed and that's okay. And to accept yourself and your flaws and, 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 question those assumptions you make about everyone else and how you think they are, are living. But um, well, with CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah, I think that our thoughts are a part of it. You know, that's going to perpetuate things and with rumination and whatnot, but it's not just the thoughts. You have to engage in the behaviors um, and expose yourself to things that make you feel slightly uncomfortable. That's the only way to work through it. Because if you just avoid it, you'll never change those neural pathways in your brain. Because the idea is exposure is going, to re, is going to change those pathways so that eventually you habituate and you're no longer as afraid, right? So let's say you're afraid to, um, I don't know, go to the grocery store now, right? Things start opening up and you still just can't get yourself and you know you need groceries and maybe there's no delivery service, whatever. You know, maybe the first time you go, it's terrifying. You know, maybe you can't even make it through the door, but you at least walk there and get to the door. Then the next time, maybe you go through the door, you know, and then the next time that's not as terrifying. And then maybe you're able to do some shopping and it's still very anxious. But over time, if you keep going and going, eventually your brain habituates and realizes, okay, nothing bad is going to happen. Nothing bad happened. I was safe, you know, and over time you become less anxious and you're able to engage in that behavior without the anxiety. And that's the sort of idea behind it. I'd be curious to know if anyone has, uh, and just as we as we have this discussion, if that comes to mind for anybody, if anyone's experienced that, if they've started to take little steps, what's been helpful for them, whether it's a store or walking outside, um, go ahead and then throw that in there. I'd be really, as, as PF just said, intentional discomfort in small doses. It's a wonderful right. way to, to phrase it. Uh, if people have experienced that, by all means, share it here. And if if you found it to be overwhelming, please share that too. It'd be, it'd be really interesting to hear. I mean, I can give you an example from my own life. I, um, so we've cooked every night since the pandemic started. We have not ordered in whatever. And uh, now my husband is getting, you know, people are getting antsy. He's like, can we just order in? Like, let's just order in. <laughs> and for me, it's been a thing. Like, why would we ex like expose ourselves to potentially something like when we can just cook and, you know, why would we? Do that. So now I'm like, you know, I, I need to get over this. Like this is an irrational fear and I'm going to purposely expose myself to something that I think is uncomfortable is getting the takeout food for whatever, you know, my reasons are like, maybe it's contaminated and whatnot, but I have to work through that. You know, I have to say, okay, we're going to try it. And the risks are low and my, you know, the risk benefit, you know, ratio again is, is I recognize that you know, I'm a little off and I need to kind of expose myself to that. So I'm going to purposely get takeout and let it be uncomfortable until it's not uncomfortable anymore. Right. Right. Yeah, Alan talks about that all the time. He's like, yeah, we're getting Chinese tonight. I was like, uh, <laughs> I haven't ordered anything out in two and a half months. Like I can cook a killer lentil soup. I never want to eat lentil soup again in my life. But at this point, with my 25 pounds of lentils, I'm amazing at lentil soup. Um, I don't, and I see people walking down the street out of my window with pizza boxes. And I'm like, oh God, what I would do. And yet I can't bring myself knowing full well that my best friend, Dr. Alan Schlechter is like, he's basically like eating pizza outside while sitting on the sidewalk. 
Um, it's amazing. And sharing with other people. Like, I just can't get there, you know? Nothing. Wow, what, goes through, what goes through your mind? <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, and we're all dealing with this as we get closer to this moment of, and, and it's something I do many, many times on, on every day. And it's what I've been talking about of risk benefit analysis. Is it worth it? Um, is the medication I'm going to prescribe worth it? Is the exposure going to be worth it? Um, and I think as particularly as parent right now, whatever it's been for you, you know, that thing of wanting to preserve my sanity and the lives of my children, um, that I don't eat them like uh, the Titan did. Um, the, that I, at a certain point, my wife and I looked at each other and I, I think, you know, my wife and I have different thresholds for it, but then we both looked at each other and we said, yeah, we have to get Chinese food. It was just, it was just what we needed and the risk was worth it and the benefit was really worth it. And um, Mushu vegetable, uh, mm. I love oh, that dish. Yeah. Mushy vegetable with hoisin sauce. You're killing me right now, man. You're killing me. So, <laughs> so, so, but. Tell me what it tasted it, like. Describe it in, real, in detail, would you please? Oh. Uh, savoring right now. I, I think, you know, we've, we've uh -huh. all been pushed. Again, going back to uh, time perception, which has always been very interesting with a lot of the kids I work with with ADHD. Um, they, they, their time perception is so challenged. Um, and what somebody asked this question, can it be improved? It can. I've seen kids get much better um, with their relationship to time. And, but that idea of my meditation practice is really uh, um, very much about my relationship with time. I mean, I meditate so I can be a vaguely nice person. Um, but but when, when I'm present, my relationship to time, all my activities, is very different. I think it. Yeah. But being in the moment, I mean, uh, you know, I'm a huge proponent of of meditation and mindfulness. But I think that um, you know, the moment is all you have is right now, and everything else is just a perception of your mind. The future is an imagination. The past is a memory, which is just another part of your brain that stores information that's also can be um, distorted. So all there is, is this moment. And if we can be fully present in it, in each moment, then, you know, you've created a good life for yourself, right? If, and so a lot of people who are dealing with anxiety or strong emotions, if you can bring them and center them, that's part of therapy of grounding you in the moment, like feel your feet on the ground, you know? put your hands on your lap and just feel um, yourself almost like connected to the earth and centered and grounded. And I think like I do yoga and that really grounds me and centers me and brings my thoughts from being all over the place um, to the moment. Mm -hmm. And and that's when I say sometimes we can be our worst enemy because our minds, you know, get the better of us and can go off in these tangents when all that really matters is where you are in this moment. And so I think that's a good practice for anyone, especially in this time right now, when things start to get overwhelming, I've had it, you know, my kids are in the house. You know, I love my kids. They're great. <laughs> They're three Everyone, she does love her children. <laughs> so please don't call child protective services. Here comes, here comes the however dot dot dot. Comes, but, <laughs> you know, they're three and six and sometimes they can, you know, prey on your nerves. Um, and you know, if I feel myself getting overwhelmed, like, oh God, you know, I have this deadline and my kids or they need me and they're screaming. And I know when I've reached my threshold, I need to walk away say to my husband, okay, I need like 15 minutes on my own. I'm going to walk around the block. I just need to kind of recenter and regroup because, you know, I feel I'm reaching my point of that's all I can take right now. And so recognizing that in yourself and taking that time for yourself to recalibrate I think is really helpful rather than just like keeping in the mix and get things get crazy and then it just gets worse, right? I love that. The idea for all parents, and I say this all the time, for every parent, you have to put your oxygen mask on first. And if it's walking around the block or whatever it is, but if you don't walk around the block, not gonna do well uh, 
for your kid. Uh, but, you know, another question that I saw that it's on my mind whenever we talk about the idea of this happiest hour, meaning you can have a happy hour, but Heather said it, and, we, and Dan and I are <laughs> acknowledge it on a daily basis with each other, that we have a lot of hours that are less than happy. And, and also the challenge right now of being present in the moment when we know so many people are suffering so much. Um, I think that's, again, speaking of the fascinating part of the human mind of what a terrible thing it is right now. What an amazing thing that our minds care so much about, in some cases, people I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, and this is something that I do to deal with, because in the beginning, especially, it's so overwhelming to think of all the suffering that's happening right now in, in, in the world. Um, you know, it's, it's, my, it's touched me slightly. My, my stepfather um, lost his mother to COVID, and she's someone who I've known for very many years and all our family events and things. Um, but I, each for me, and this is what I call sort of worry time um, with patients, but I do this for myself. Whereas in the beginning, I was consumed by everything that was going on, the news and taking in all the information. And it was, you know, I had to know, but it was eroding me. And now I have a set time in the day where, you know, I take in the information and I also, I grieve, you know, I think about the um, importance of this moment and what is happening right now, you know, in New York right now. Okay. We're on the downside of a curve, but, a hundred people on average are dying a day. I mean, that's still a huge amount. In all of Australia throughout this whole pandemic, a hundred people died altogether. And we're mm -hmm. having daily a hundred people dying. And so I do take time to, to think about the, the, um, the sadness and allow myself to be sad and, and, and take in the information. And then I know I, for my own mental health, I need to let it go. I need to then focus in on what's happening in my immediate life right now um, you know, and, and live my life. I can't be consumed by this all the time. And so I think that's healthy. That's a healthy approach to be aware, to be cognizant, to be human and to have empathy, but also let it go sometimes and just, you know, be present in your own life. Yeah. yeah. Being, being human is a topic that's come up. It's, it's been a theme, I should say. That I, I would argue throughout all the, you know, you're the seventh uh, person that we, we've been able to welcome to the show. And that's been consistent. You know, being human, uh, whether it's talking about hope or stress. I mean, you start talking about being in the moment. Last week we had, you know, Jonathan Fader, and we're talking about how to deal with stress. And he's like, look, can't control what happened yesterday, can't control what happened tomorrow. He said, you know, for the Dalai Lama, to say, what can I do right now? How can I be in the moment right now? So whether it's that or trying to savor something and know that this is where I am, and yes, there's lots of inequality, and yes, there are people who are really challenged, and yes, I will do my very best to help in every, any way I can. Right now, this is where I am. Uh, and that's a go back to mindfulness too much, but training one's ability. Let's go back to William James, you know, the, the education that of being able to focus one's attention is compass sui. It's the, it's the greatest education one could have. And that takes time and effort. So, uh, so being able to do that hopefully will pay off whether you're looking at your three and six year old going, I got to get out of here right now. I know where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm able to be mindful of that or on a much bigger scale and going in globally, I need to be here right now. Yeah. yeah. And I think what, if, you know, I was to give another tip that has also been helpful for me is to like find whatever it is that you do that gets you into that kind of flow state of like where you lose your sense of time and self and place, whether it's listening to music, going for a run, painting, um, you know, whatever that activity is for you where you get lost, maybe you're lost in a book, but allowing yourself to um in some ways dissociate which it's not good if you do it all the time but if in small doses um it can be healthy to be free of that um self critic and self-awareness and kind of let go so if any of you you know whatever you know what your flow state is and maybe it's just when you're in the shower singing but allow yourself to go to those places to go to your kind of safe place you know whether it's going for a walk and listening to music um, but make space for that for yourself. Um, it's just as important as exercising. Um, it's just as important as meeting that deadline. And I think that's also like a, a tip that 
I always incorporate into my life is like allow myself to go to that place that I really enjoy and be in that kind of flow state. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I would be curious to know before we, before we call it an hour, what are things that people are finding? How are they finding their flow state? What are some activities that are out there? Jamie ran 10 and I'm thinking about you because as I said, my college roommate, every, every couple of days I see an image on Instagram of him holding onto a fish because he gets out and he fly fishes, drives, you know, he lives out in Philly. That's his place. And he goes with his son or both of them. Um, what are some other things that people are finding? Journaling, painting, reading. Yeah. Yeah. Cooking. That's Cooking. one. Dancing. Yeah, right. Jigsaw puzzles. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. ukulele -ing. Walking in the woods. I love walking. Walking is my thing. I love walking in nature. Yeah. This is it. And it's, it's wonderful because there's such variety. And yet I, I've yet to see one that hasn't. I'm a Kava, by the way, taking the dog to the park. Um, I get to see one that hasn't been mentioned twice. Right. So there yeah. are people who are sharing these and yet there's a huge diversity. Of them. Well, I, I think what I would wish for everyone uh, in the next week, uh, we started off this hour by talking about what people would do with their willpower mm -hmm. and and what they would accomplish. But actually, the way you might get the time with that willpower is actually by also giving yourself the time to go into a state of flow is to give yourself the time to actually not be working on what you want to accomplish. Um, That's my mantra is, um, is gaining control by letting go mm. in a controlled way. You don't want to be let go all the time and then you'll be completely impulsive, but you can gain some more control if you allow yourself to let go um, in small doses. You know, one of the things that's been so wonderful about today, Heather, and you know, thank you again, has mm -hmm. been uh, not only helping us understand what's happening up here and what's happening, sort of our sense of control or lack thereof, time lack thereof, uh, willpower lack thereof, but also really how specific you've been able to share kind of next steps with us in a way. You know, the opportunity to let go, even if it's taking time to, on your schedule to let go, to take time to just let go, whether it's walking or daydreaming or whatever it might be. You know, the idea that um, we can train our attention to know where it is we are, to focus on where we are, to be present. Uh, and also, I think for, for me, one of, the, one of the takeaways that's so important is that it's gradual. Whether we're talking about trying to get into a, a, a sense of engagement in the next week, or we're getting ourselves ready for when things open up, that it is gradual. It's not, it has, doesn't have to be eight hours a day, it doesn't have to be super intense. It's going, okay, I've taken three steps closer to the grocery store that's three blocks down and now I'm at the end of the block and tomorrow I'll be two blocks down and eventually I'll get there. You know, those, those three things have been so unique and yet they've been so wonderfully helpful. So, you know, we, we, we started this whole hour with the question of what would you do differently? If you had more willpower, what is one thing that, that you know, that, how would you apply it? And hopefully if you think back to what you wrote in the very beginning, you're able now to apply some of the steps that Heather's been so wonderful, and, and Alan's been so wonderful and clear in how they've shared it so that you can find these things. Um, we're not gonna say goodbye yet, because before we do, um, I have to just mention uh, next week, uh, we've been so, so lucky. I think part, you know, part, of the, part of the silver, one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that we're able to find time, well, that people offer us time that normally would be really challenging. I promise you this, if um, this wasn't happening right now, Heather Berlin would not give me the time of day. Um, so, so thank you. <laughs> um, and so next week we have another person like that. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Dan Riskin, uh, who Heather knows as well, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. who probably wouldn't return my calls either. Uh, as you know, Dan's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, Dan is an evolutionary biologist. And when we first invited him on, he was like, why are you inviting me on to a show called The Happiest Hour? My expertise is in, he wrote a book called uh, Mother Nature's Trying to Kill You. And I was like, no, no, Dan, there's a reason to have you here. Uh, we want to talk about how to understand what's going on around us in a realistic way so that we can manage it, so we can understand what, it, what is real science and what is questionable. Um, and also, one of Dan's passions is passion. How do you nurture it in a time like this? So um, after this show, we'll have up on the screen... Um, uh, an image that will tell you where to go, where to register. You can also go to www.happiesthour.org. Um, That'll allow you to register too. So um, as always, uh, it, it'll be free. As always, we encourage people to 
to donate five dollars to No Kid Hungry, the foundation that, that we have um, trying our best to be able to to help. Um, but thank you, Heather, for thank you, Heather. for being here today. You've been absolutely wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for making the time. You know? Thank you for having me, and thanks for everybody who tuned in to listen. And um, it's such a pleasure to kind of be with you all and feel the community. So thanks for having me. Be sure to check out Heather and all of her multiple other other ways, uh, all of her shows, all of her uh, uh, videos and, and, and her writing. Uh, but for right now, thanks again for joining us at The Happiest Hour Live, where no matter where you are right now, uh, if things are wonderful or if things are challenging, each week we strive to help you make life just a bit, bit better. So have a happier week, everybody. Thank you for being here. Take care.